Okay, hey there, welcome back everybody to uh, the sixth installment in our series on the basics of economic regulation. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about uh, the rate of return, allowable rate of return, or so called rate of return regulation, uh, as well as then uh, sort of incentive regulation. And in this video, really, what we're talking about are some of the complications associated with the return to capital in regulated industry and some of the ways in which we uh, attempt to build uh, safeguards into our general regulatory to uh, avoid as much as possible those problems. What we're doing with rate of return regulation is we're recognizing that first of all there, there's a public interest in the regulated firm continuing or firms continuing to operate and second of all we're recognizing that if a firm is to continue operating it needs to have a return uh, such that it's able to justify its existence so for example if we think about um, you know an entrepreneur uh, uh, thinking about whether to start a business or not right that business has to be able to generate some kind of return that's at least equal to what that entrepreneur could earn in the marketplace in other words, capital invested, whether it's in a regulated business or not, needs to earn a certain rate of return. Okay, so with rate of return regulation, what we're attempting to do is to uh, say, you know, look at sort of what is put into that firm in terms of capital, equipment, machinery, so on and so forth, and then how much of a return does the firm need to c get back out of it to continue to um, justify. Uh, a longer run investment. So before we get too much into uh, that, right, we need to sort of review a little bit about uh, some some basic microeconomics of the firm. You know, generally in microeconomics, we characterize firms as production functions. So that is to say, a firm brings in a series of uh, inputs, which you know, firm has to hire workers, has to you know, build a factory or rent a factory, it has to buy equipment, so on and so forth. Um, and, and then, you know, it uses those things to produce finished goods and services. So, of course, you know, in any given business, there's a variety of ways to do things, right? The firm could utilize a lot of labor or it could utilize a lot of capital and then a little bit of the other factor production. So, you know, the example that always comes to my mind is, you know, when we I, I drive by a road construction project uh, here. Uh, which those firms are often regulated. <laughs> and uh, I see a lot of machinery and just maybe two or three workers on the road construction project. But you go to the developing world and you see the same type of road construction project and you're going to see hundreds and hundreds of workers and maybe only a couple of pieces of machinery. And that has to do with the relative costs of labor and capital uh, in those different places. Okay, so here we're talking about the firm's sort of choice of production inputs, you know, how much capital they utilize, how much labor, right? Okay, now over here on the top line, we have this idea that the price, okay, is a function of the quantity produces, which in turn is a function of the capital and labor employed, right? So we're going to break down the things that firm uses into these two categories of labor and capital. Um, we're further going to say that W is the, uh, in this case, the price of labor or the wage rate, and lowercase s is the allowable return on capital, uh, and R is the market price of capital. Okay, um, profits then, of course, can be expressed like this, and the profit maximizing output for, uh, in this case, the regulated firm becomes this here where what we're doing is we're equalizing the marginal product of capital over the price of capital, the marginal product of labor over the price of labor. Okay. And if we had, you know, if we weren't simplifying this down to two inputs, right, sort of the max profit maximizing mix of inputs would be that same ratio of the marginal product of that factor over its price across all factors. Essentially what you're doing is you're, you're equalizing bang for buck for each factor. Now, some of you may be looking at this and saying, oh, what's that alpha term there? That's a little unusual. That's right. Normally, we would say just MPK over R, or the marginal product of capital over the price of capital R. But we're introducing this idea of alpha in here as 
the difference between the allowable return on capital and the market price of capital. So we're going to get more into the next slide, but to quickly visual to think about that, think of you know we allowed the firm to earn seven percent a return, and the market return on capital is five percent. To clarify this idea, consider over here. So where alpha is this term lambda, which we'll uh, get into in a second, times s minus r over one minus lambda. Okay, s is the allowable return on capital, like I just described a moment ago. R is the cost of capital or the market rate on capital. Okay. Now you might be saying, well, why do we need to allow a higher rate of return on the regulated firm than than the market? Well, we don't, right? We don't. Uh, there are reasons why we would do that, which we'll discuss later on. But let's just say they don't for a second. Okay, then S minus R equals zero, right? And this whole thing here, right, goes away, right? It's, it's zero, right? So going back to the previous slide, it becomes irrelevant, right? Then it's there's no sort of problem, right? But there are reasons why we, we wouldn't want to do that, which again, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a little later on. Now, this lambda term is what we call Lagrange multiplier, and it will vary between zero and one. And what it's doing is it's measuring the increase in actual profit associated with change in allowable profit. Okay, now, you know, you can read what it's, the rest of what it says here. Now, this is occurring because if we're allowing a rate of return on capital that's greater than the market rate of return, then what we're essentially doing is incentivizing the regulated firm's uh, use of capital. So, for example, let, let's, let's say we're talking about a power company, right? If every time the power company makes an investment in sort of its capital stock, it earns a profit, um, well, it has incentive to do so. It has incentive to lay more line. It has incentive to uh, maybe bring in more capital equipment, um, et cetera, than it otherwise would, right? And then so, you know, Lambda is capturing how their actual profit is impacted by our incentivization of the given rate of return. Okay. Over here, we see sort of a formalization of that idea. Now, there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to kind of walk through the step by step with the cursor here. Okay, now what we have here is three what we call ISO cost fund lines one, two, three, one ISO cost relationship. And we'll remember from our rudimentary microeconomics that sort of where uh, the ISO quant uh, function is tangent to the ISO cost represents our optim optimized input mix, right? So if you can remember that, sort of good. If not, you know, go back and check basic microeconomics. Now we're going to say that this ISO cost function NN represents the actual market costs of labor, L, and capital. Right, so this slope of this represents the ratio of W to R, or R to W, depending upon how we're expressing it, or wages to uh, interest in, in the most basic sense. Okay. Um, however, uh, if if S is greater than R, so the allowable return is greater than the market rate of return, then what ends up happening is that the firm is going to perceive the cost of capital as being lower than it otherwise would. Okay, so it effectively cheapens capital relative to labor. And so let's say that that value, that cost of capital to the firm, ends up being perceived as the ISO cost function TT. Now you notice that it's flatter, right, Rep representing what a lower cost of capital relative to labor. Let us say then that this causes the firm to produce, or sorry, consume the consumption of, consume the quantities of labor and capital, L star, K star, and produce at point F tangent to the ISO quant. Now, <clears throat> We'll notice that, of course, it's utilizing less labor than it otherwise would and more capital due to the subsidized price of capital due to regulation. Okay. Now, because the sort of firm can earn this higher return, right? Okay. Now, that gives us then the final ISO cost relationship of MM, which passes through 
point F. Okay. Now the vertical distance between NN and MN, this firm is operating at point F. Uh, what what they're what they're doing then is they're operating at a, in in inefficient manner, right? They're over utilizing capital and they're under utilizing labor. So the cost, the sort of real cost out there to the rest of the world is this relationship MN, or sorry, MN, excuse me, M, MM. <laughs> so the vertical distance between NN and MM is what? It's the reduction in efficiency, um, the, the, the degree to which the regulated firm is failing to minimize real cost due to what due to regulatory subsidization of the cost of capital so how do we remedy this you know how do we sort of fix this right now before we get into that too much there are reasons why we might want to so you may say well why just you know what just like make the rate of return the market rate of return and call quits okay well, there's reasons why you might want to provide slight subsidies. The first reason that, that, that you might want to provide a slight subsidy in terms of rate of return is because you want it to be stable and predictable, right? So um, it, it, the market rate of return, of course, moves around, right? The price of capital changes over time. And if you're sort of picking an amount, you know, maybe you want a bit of a sort of safety measure, right? And you want it to be a little higher than the current rate of return under the idea that, you know, it, it, it could, could go up, right? The market rate of return could go up. Um, it, it may also be that, that, okay, so this is a regulated industry. So it's, you know, sort of faces irregular burdens, right? And so maybe it needs a little extra bit of a kick to draw capital to it effectively. Maybe it's the case that there's a recognized public benefit from this thing. Um, you know, so most like natural monopolies provide sort of positive externalities. Okay, so maybe it's that as you want to uh, recognize in the rate of return. Okay, you want to make sure it keeps going because of this you know, positive externality. There's a variety of reasons why you might want to choose a regulated rate of return slightly higher than the market rate of return. And so this all comes into bear, you know, you don't want the firm now to overutilize capital <laughs> um, as a result of your doing that. Okay. So what you do is you, is you have a process by which the regulated firm has to go to some sort of board. Uh, it could be a judiciary to approve um, additional uses of capital. So, you know, the, the firm wants to bring in a set of new production processes. Okay, maybe it needs to go before a board uh, to ensure that to, for them to be able to do that. The board's going to allow them to do that. And, uh, you know, what, what they're sort of looking for there whether is whether that investment is in the public interest, whether the investment's really going to help the firm operate efficiently, uh, or whether this is sort of a, a boondoggle now, of course, as you know, those are sort of processes goes back and forth. Um, it's a story. I'll leave it there. Uh, they can be quite complex and they can go on for quite a long period of time. Um, I, I, I've personally seen them go into years, um, <laughs> been a part of where they go into years. Uh, they can get uh, quite, quite tricky. Then moving on to this idea of incentive regulation, where incentive is the incentive to lower costs. Now we just saw how with rate of return regulation, there can be this incentive for firms to over overcapitalize and then pass those capitalization costs on to consumers in the form of higher prices. Right. Okay. Well, so what can occur, what we can do is in addition to sort of the processes, the regulatory processes and judicial processes that we just described, we can also employ price caps, right? And so we can sort of lock in prices for a period of time. Now, uh, of course, as economists, we know there, there are often issues with locking in prices and we just talked about them in the last lecture. Um, um, so we want to be aware of those, but then also we want to introduce the idea that we're likely to include into these prices various escalators. That is the rate at which we're going to allow the price to increase. Could be CPI, could be PPI, could be, you know, whatever. You, it's usually what everybody agrees upon. Uh, in my experience, people like CPI because everybody knows it, even when it's not necessarily appropriate, oddly enough. Okay.
Second of all, we're going to allow for sort of a, what, what your textbook's calling these X factors. Now, those can take a variety of forms. Here we see discuss the idea of productivity offsets. So, you know, if there's gains in productivity, then, you know, we'll allow prices to adjust, things like that. Z factors can be other things that, that allow for, that allow the, that are factors built into the regulatory structure that allow for adjustments. So, uh, for example, maybe if you have like a natural disaster, right, it knocks down a whole bunch of power lines or something like that, uh, the regulatory might allow for firms to undertake sort of emergency capital investment to restore power without going through those processes, which then might require them to pass on higher costs to consumers in the short run. Okay. Uh, so things that are sort of beyond the firm's control, uh, generally you build in sort of safeguards into the regulatory to ensure that the firm is able to continue to operate uh, profitably even in these adverse environments. Okay, now the final thing that we'll talk about this lecture is so-called yardstick regulation. Uh, in my experience, again, more commonly called benchmark regulation. And how this sort of works is we're going to sort of look around at the other firms in this industry, right, and it may be in another nation, it may be in another place, it's outside of sort of a regulated zone. We're going to try to find out sort of what works, what isn't working, um, what are sort of ideal firms doing, and then build it into the regulation for all firms. Okay, now <clears throat> your book sort of, the textbook for this course, right, sort of, sort of puts a damper on this. In my experience, uh, it, it, it's quite commonplace, and, and I would add to that, that any time we're really, you know, choosing a rate of return, right, or, or really any time we're choosing a regulated price, we're employing, we're sort of thinking about what's best, right? Uh, but it's best to, to us and maybe a host of other people, we all kind of come to agreement upon what's best. In other words, like, I guess what I'm getting at is that there is no truly objective anything. <laughs> um, however, with, with this benchmark regulation, what we're doing is sort of picking best practices, and then we're building that into the regulation beyond it being very intuitive. So it's like, oh, yeah, well, of course, you know, what have been be intuitive? <clears throat> well, if one firm can do it, then, then other firms can do it, right? So... Now, sometimes you'll create a regulation and people say, oh, that's impossible or whatever. Or what, you know, this sort of thing, if, if you're sort of choosing best practices and regulating it, you can't really say that it's impossible. Um, it, it does have some problems, you know, which I alluded to a moment ago. Uh, you, you know, when you sort, of, you sort of make a choice about what's best, uh, there, there are always value judgments in that. So, for example, you might look look at a regulatory, uh, you know, an industry you want to regulate and say, oh, well, it should be, you know, green, it should be environmentally responsible, it should be uh, good to the consumers and good to the workers. Okay, well, what do we mean by environmentally responsible? What do we mean by good to the consumers? What do we mean by good to the workers? We're creating our own sort of metric in doing that about what we think is good. And that's always an imperfect process. If we only look at our own opinions, that's a highly imperfect process. If we have a sort of community discussion about what those are, well, that's a better process, right? And maybe if we have a discussion amongst all stakeholders in this process, maybe that's, maybe that's a pretty good process for determining what's good. But we should recognize that it, that it is an imperfect process. And we should also recognize that, you know, it, it, it may impose, uh, some firms may have a hard time meeting that standard, okay? Uh, particularly firms that have higher operating costs. In my experience, it continually crops up in society. You know, it's here, like it looks like, oh, well, firms with high operating costs, why would you ever, you know, who cares, right? Well, you know, I'm speaking to you from Wisconsin right now. There's a lot of agriculture in this state. And uh, you know who has high operating costs relative to their industry? Small farms. <laughs> Okay. Big factory farm, low operating costs per, you know, ton of yield. Small family farm, high operating costs. Okay. Uh, you know what type of businesses have high costs? Small businesses. <laughs> you know what tend to have? Okay. You get the idea, right? There's a lot of sociological and political sort of issues that one runs afoul of here. Okay. So 
you know, be aware of that. Okay, so that's enough for this time. Um, we'll see you again next time. Uh, we're about, we're getting close to halfway done with the, this series of lectures. I hope you're all enjoying it so far. I'm having fun with it. Um, I will see you again next time. Take care.